Good morning from Portland, Oregon. I'm Randy Hopkins. Welcome to Comprise and welcome to TechCrunch. This is where we bite into topics and demonstrate a functionality or use case that our audience asks about and want to know about. So we call it TechCrunch because we take a technical approach and we show you how it's done. We try to keep it short. We try to keep it under 15 minutes so you can have it with a short cup of coffee. Today, we're going to be focusing on TMT, also known as Comprise Transparent Move Technology. What this is, is our cool patented approach, a fresh approach to enable data movement and tiering or archiving without any disruption or or, or interference to the applications or the users. A key use case for Comprise is the ability to find cold data, for example, and what we see across the ecosystem of our customers is about 76% of their data is cold, meaning it hasn't been accessed at all, no reads, no writes in more than a year. And we can take that data and we can transparently archive it or tier it to any storage, whether it be on the cloud or on-prem. All of this happening without the end users having to change anything. And we've got a fresh approach that doesn't require software software on the servers or the applications, and we never get in front of the hot data. And we call this TMT. So how do we make TMT happen? How do we move data with zero interference to the application to end users? That's the question we get. Today, we're gonna to show you how. So keep in mind though, that there are no drivers, no agents on any sort of laptop or desktop or application server. There's no drivers or agents on the server that we use to move the data. Um, we're not in front of the hot data path. We do not use that four letter word that you know as the word stub. And uh, so how do I access the data from my application? And really importantly, we're getting more and more folks that wanna do this is how do I access that data once it's been moved in the location it's been moved to? Maybe it's been moved to an object store in the cloud, for example. Can I leverage that as a data lake and access it in that location as well as accessing it from the, the original location? So today we're gonna show you how that's done. So let's go to the next slide and, and see the agenda and introduce my very, very, very special guest, Eric Platt. So Eric Platt, we're going to go to presenter mode and have a, a cup of coffee together. Whoa, look at that blue shirt you got going on. And are you on that side of me or the other side of me? I am on this side of you. <laughs> well, anyway, welcome. Glad to be here and glad we have matching shirts today. It's yeah. uh, a little warmer where I'm at halfway across the country in Southern Ohio. We're at 90 degrees at 11 a.m. So I'd much rather be in your shoes. 90, a little bit of humidity going on. Yep. So I'm drinking water, not coffee. It's a little too hot for coffee today. Hmm. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining the, 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 uh, the technical podcast this morning. All right. Well, thank you very much, Randy. So we're going to start out today and kind of get more insight into our data first. So before we make any decisions on getting into the transparent move technology or TMT, our really focus first of all needs to be what kind of data do we have out there, how cold it is, and what do we need to do to be able to save money? So we'll start with our plan analysis before we do any kind of actually tiering or data movement. And here you can see our color age wheel or our donut that we like to call it. And you'll be able to see the age of your data and make decisions based upon that different criteria. And you can see here within this environment, I've got some pretty fresh data here that's represented in the orange. If I had some very fresh data, it would be represented in red. And as I go around, the data keeps getting older over time. Do we get to the blue where we consider that that cold data? You can see just based upon this graph, about 50% of my data has not been accessed in over a year. We also give you some growth trends, the, what business as usual is gonna look like over the next couple of years. And you can see I'm gonna have about a 77% increase on my on-prem storage footprint for NAS over the next three years. And from a lot of conversations we have with customers and the IDC, most customers' data is actually doubling every two years. So you can see where it's just gonna keep compounding and growing and growing and growing. So we can help utilizing our transparent move technology and what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a plan and be able to start creating what if scenarios. What if I wanted to archive off all data that was older than three years? And you can see that in the purple and white here, it's about 12% of the data. We wanna get super aggressive and do a year. We also have cost savings information, which we'll go into in a different check crutch section. But today we wanna to focus on the actual transparent move technology and what that looks like from an end user experience because there's a lot of other archiving solutions out there and tiering solutions. And we wanna really show the difference in how our TMT is our crown jewel and what really differentiates us from all of the other vendors out there and taking this old problem and finding a new way to solve it. So in this particular example, after where you've gotten to the point where we want to go ahead and activate that plan, I would activate it. And it's gonna start in most cases, ar uh, archiving this data off outside of my lab. The next thing is, is 
what happens next? As an end user, what's my experience? Am I going to have to go to a website to be able to download the file? Am I going to have to go and do a restore job? How, how am I as an end user going to be able to access that data? This is where Comprise is very unique. We use standard file constructs in everything that we do. So instead of using your traditional stub files or tiering at the block level and things of that nature, we're doing everything with standard file constructs. So both for SMB and NFS data, we utilize symbolic links. And the secret behind the scenes behind our symbolic links is after that data is moved off, we leave behind a symbolic link that to the end user looks like a shortcut. So you can see all these different shortcuts are here, all the directory structure is still intact. I've archived off almost this entire directory. But then if I go and double click the file, it brings it back fairly quickly from my object store in the cloud that that data is stored onto. And it'll open it up so I can be able to view it and be able to look at it, do what I need to do with it. Behind the scenes, what happens, and this is kind of the, the magician revealing the secrets of what occurs behind the scenes, is we point to what's called a comprised access address or CA address. And this is a fully qualified domain name assigned to an empty IP address in the environment, then in a turn is assigned to one of our observers and outside of our observer grid, which is our, our lightweight virtual appliances that are installed that are all the worker bees. And then what will happen is he translate this to the target ID location, which is this 3113, that's my cloud bucket, and then the source ID, which is 3115, which is my actual SMB share. So we're able to be able to point to these different directories and these different locations and be able to make the determination where it lives at, where it needs to come back to. And it's all done very, very quickly through our comprised cloud file system. Additionally, there, there, was, a, there was a question sent over to us. Awesome. Might as well answer it off it. Looks like it's relative to this, to this, uh, this screen you got going on. So how are these different than stub files in the old days? And when, what, what were those stub files? Might want to throw that out there too. Great question. So with stub files, all of the metadata is stored with the actual stub file itself. So they've always been very susceptible to corruption. Sometimes virus scanners would accidentally pull the files back because it didn't understand the underlying architecture. And it was very cumbersome and very not user friendly. If you deleted the stub file, you could never get your data back. You'd never be able to access that data that's been archived to a different tier of storage, whether it's the cloud, on-prem, or a NAS file. But with using symbolic links, we store all the metadata on the target side, which means we have native file access to all that data at all times, even if I can't access the symbolic link. So in that case, let's say I can't access any of my symbolic links because my source share is down or I have an issue. I can actually mount that comprised access address and point it to the bucket and that share location and be able to access that data directly on the cloud bucket, native file format, directory structures intact, all of my file permissions intact. So if I don't have access to the data on-prem through the NAS share, I would not have access through it through this manner. But you can see here, all of the native files are in their native file format. So it enables me to be able to have a better approach to my data management and be able to not have that vendor lock-in. There's no proprietary wrappers around the data that Comprise is putting. So if you decide that later down the road, 10 years, you want to migrate off of Comprise to something else, you have to recall all that data. That's not necessary. All the data is stored in its native file format. Additionally, from a bucket perspective, and this is my AWS bucket that we were just looking at on-prem, if I go to my AWS console, you can see here all the files are there in the directory structure, all in a native file format so that we're able to be able to go out there and make use of that data. So it's very, very transparent and it's very easily to be able to do data migrations later on as well. So we're not locking you in to have to recall all the data. We can do your data migrations of only that hot data without recalling. There was another question too, by the way. It says when, when uh, those symbolic links are sitting there in that share that you were showing earlier and a backup system backs that data up, What's going to happen? Is it going to follow those links? Great question. So what happens for a uh, majority of the backup providers out there is they're going to back up the symbolic link. Same with snapshotting. So if you're snapshotting your NetApp, your Isilon systems, Cumulo, whatever it is, we're going to snapshot those symbolic links to be able to give you the data protection of those link files. On the back end, it won't follow and back up everything that's on the object store or the other piece of it. We use things like uh, the geo dispersion within the clouds to be able to provide that level of protection. Or we also have the capabilities within Comprise to actually create a secondary copy of that data using the move policy as well. So you could create two copies of the data that's been archived. 
So this also helps shrink your backup footprint as well as your storage footprint. So you think about sometimes you have two, three, four different copies of your backup data. We can help really utilize that to be able to shrink that backup footprint as well as your storage footprint as well. Is there any other questions in the chat, Randy? Yeah, what does it look like um, when an SMB file is sent to AWS? I'm not sure, what do you, what do you think that means? So when we archive to AWS, you're going to be able to log into your console or use a third party tool like S3 browser or CyberDuck. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there on the market and you can browse the directory structure just like it was on prem in your shares. So you can see here, if I go in and I look at this PDF file. I could download that. I can click on it, find out the information about it, the metadata information, et cetera, or I could download that file to be able to look at it. You can see here, I can download that file and open it up. Well, I hope everybody found this beneficial today. Look forward to being able to teach you guys more as we continue these tech crunch sections. And Rain, it's always a pleasure to be able to present with you. Cool. Yeah, same here. Hey, there was a uh, there's a question that I get frequently. Can Comprise do the analytics on the files that it's archived? Only the analytics on the files is archived, or does it also see data about the data, uh, basically the metadata about files it hasn't archived? Um, the answer to that question, folks, is yes. We we can uh, we can mount and look at all the data in the infrastructure and, and collect the metadata about that data and, and do the analytics about that data, even if it's not under a particular plan that's already being tiered off. So yes, so that's how we can create a data lake. For example, a user can say, I wanna find all the files that were created by a particular person. Uh, I wanna tier all that data off to a certain location. I want to be able to look at that as a single bucket, if you will. We have the ability to do that as well. So we do have a lot of resources, folks. You can find us on LinkedIn. Um, there are blogs, there's webinars on our website. Uh, you can search for tech crunch. If you want to ask yourself, will my application work with some of those symbolic links, uh, contact an SE at Comprise, contact me. We'll show you how to set up a little test that you can test your application on. So next time we get together, by the way, we're going to be covering some uh, a couple other new topics. Uh, we're going to be covering uh, writing to worm compliant devices. And then after that, we'll talk about the new functionality of leveraging deep analytics with operation. Till next time. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Randy. Thanks, everyone.